um, make sure that uh, you all are receiving the good vibes that you need to move into this uh, season. Uh, my name is Kesia Seniceros, and I'm the Associate Dean for the TRIO programs at Everett Community College in Washington State. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing um, our my great colleague, uh, Dr. Tracy Bertzell, um, who will be uh, uh, providing a, a, some of your your uh, some of the information for the beginning of today's professional development. Um, we will then um, move into a short breakout uh, sessions um, per program. Um, we do not ha currently have a McNair breakout session. We did not have a lead. So I'm going to look through the chat and see if we can identify some uh, an impromptu lead uh, for McNair. Um, but if we don't have anyone, we're going to go ahead and move that into the SSS group. Um, so you'll see those breakout sessions. We're also going to monitor time and really look at if we if if conversation or questions are still coming up around what what Tracy is presenting, um, then we'll extend the time a little bit and then uh, shorten the breakout session times. So again, welcome and I pass it over to Tracy. All right, thank you for that, Cassie. I appreciate it. So again, my name is Tracy Birdsell. I am the Associate Dean of Student Success at Lewis Clark State College. I have a talent search program. Um, I previously had a SSS program. I currently oversee a camp program as well as our um, Student Success Center, which does student tutoring on campus and our Warrior Pantry. I oversee advising and the Student Employment Center as well. So I kind of have a little bit of everything going on. Um, I was also, I've been um, in trios for 16 years now, um, have served in various roles across um, Idaho and NAOP and um, worked as a peer reviewer as well. So I'm gonna kind of use a lot of that information for today's um, discussion. I really focus today's discussion, it seems a lot on budgetary things. So there's lots of different ways we can go. Of course, you can go to whole trainings on this that are two days long, three days long, and we have you know, 25, 30 minutes. So I had to cut some things. So if you have questions in other areas, um, you, you know, put it into the chat and we'll see if we have time to address those as well. Um, and please, again, put um, feel free to ask questions um, and we'll go from there. So I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So can you all see me at all or can you just see my screen? I'm not sure what, I see nods, but I don't hear, you can see both. Okay, cool. So my, um, I'm looking at my second screen. So if I'm not looking at the, looking straight at you, it's because it's on my other screen. So the first thing I wanna do is talk about the trio hierarchy or the trio triangle, the trio pyramid. So you've probably seen this or heard of this, but it's important to start, I think every trio legislation, regulation, conversation around. So the trio legislation is the height of what we must follow, okay? So the legislation comes from Congress, which they're doing um, some negotiated rulemaking right now. So some of that might be changing. The last update was in 2008. Um, prior to that, they had typically done updates every five to eight years. So it's been a long time since we've had an update. Um, those things can um, work in our favor, sometimes can work against us, depending on what's in there. And But it's something that we need to live by and it's rules that we need to follow. Next are the program regulations. So what happens when you have the legislation? It's very, it's broad. Um, then when the Department of Ed does their interpretation of it, and that's where the program regulations come out. Okay, then after that, we have the, um, the super circulars or the uniform guidance as it's known now, I need to update this, sorry. Um, and then the guidelines, grant application, APR, OMB approved communications, those are next. Then our approved grant proposal and then institutional policies and procedures. So there's going to be times when we are going to be navigating as whether we are directors or um, administrative assistants or advisors, there's gonna be times when we're navigating all of these different levels. And so that's why sometimes you um, might not get a direct answer, 
because sometimes there's a gray area that we're in. There's not a clear yes or no that are in the legs and regs. And so we get to make a call on that and we base it on this hierarchy. Um, like for example, if you put something, um, for example, like going to a play, taking our students to a play, uh, cultural events are an allowable cost, right? That's in our program regulations. However, um, in the, the circulars, it says that you can't pay for entertainment. Well, since our regulations kind of trump that circular, that's what allows us to be able to do that. Okay, but we want to make sure that we're um, showing why we're doing things like that as well. So next, this is the Code of Federal Regulations, so Title 34, this is where we're, we're trios under. So you can see here that um, all of us have a different subsection that we're, that we're in. Okay, so I want to show this. Now, one of the things that I have, I'm very old school, I guess, I get, I don't know, I guess I can say that because I'm 50 now, so I'm old school. And I have this, I have them printed out in my handy dandy binder here. And I have my little um, pink stickies to go where things are. Um, I also have the, the um, OMB in, again, kind of in book format. You can get all of this online. All of this is, you know, it's searchable online. And so if that's how you work best, then use that method, but you need to be fluent in this language that is TRIO. And I think it's really important, if you are an advisor, sometimes it can be, you, can, you might be of a thought that that's the director's job to be able to know if I can do things or not, but really it's everybody's job because we need to see how we all fit together into what we're doing. And it's important for everybody to be able to understand the whys. A director should be able to say, yes, we can do this or no, we can't and why. Um, and you need to be able to be able to come up with great new ideas and say, hey, this isn't, it doesn't say yes and it doesn't say no. So could we do X? Um, because I think it'd be beneficial to our students. So it's, this is good knowledge for everybody. Okay, so determining allowable costs. So a lot of times we wanna know where we can spend our money. What it says here is that there's three things you need to know for allowable costs. First, they must be reasonable. So would the reasonable and prudent person say that this is not, that they should do this? Sometimes what's, what's challenging is our state contracts. So for like computers, I was looking for a new computer today and um, our desktops there because we have our under state contract are $1,200. Well, I know I could find a decent desktop for probably $700 and save my grant money. However, I have to use a state contract because I have to follow my institutional policies and procedures. So there's sometimes where reasonable costs, we can kind of be... Um, Kind of go back and forth a little bit like i don't think i'm a reasonable person and i don't think this is a reasonable cost but according to our constraints sometimes they need to be a that's kind of what would be a reasonable cost next they need to be allocable meaning that the grant needs to be able to be put on that certain grant so if i wanted to if i had an sss program and i had a talent search program and let's say that my talent search program ran out of money, but my SSS still budget still has money. Can I charge my talent search trip to my SSS grant? No, I can't. That's not allocable. Okay, it doesn't fit. That isn't where it goes. So that's why we need to keep track of our budgets. And it needs to be consistent as well with the policies and procedures. So what, what happens on your campuses needs to be consistent with grant funds and with non-grant funds, okay? Okay, sorry, this, my mouse is, I need to just click, I think. Are there any questions about that? We're good, okay. So the next thing, so here's some unallowable costs. So this is under 
um, so this happens to be an EOC one, unallowable cost. This is also, um, I picked certain ones I didn't grab from everybody. So this happens to be EOC. You can't pay tuition stipends or fees or direct financial support for participants. It's the same thing in talent search. You can't do research that's not directly related to the evaluation or improvement of a project. So it's allowable to have a peer review done, an outside evaluator come in and do a peer review because it is directly related to the evaluation of the project. Um, and pretty much none of the grants um, can have any get paid for any construction, renovation, or remodeling of the facilities. The Department of Ed figures that's what your FNA costs are for, or the indirect costs that that eight percent that the um, institution can charge to the grant. So that's what they figure is part of that. For so, if we move into our upward bound programs, um, unallowable costs, the research here. For example, meals for staff, unless dormitory supervision of participants in residential summer component or overnight supervision on field projects such as field trips. So if there's just staff hanging around, so the admin maybe is hanging around working that day, um, isn't really helping with the programming, then she shouldn't be um, be able to eat with the pro eat with the rest of them, for example, unless she's supervising students. But if she's just there for the day at work, then that wouldn't be an allowable cost. But there is an allowable cost for, so Upper Bound, um, McNair, SSS, all allow for student stipends, right? So there's stipulations around that, that it has to be like for UB, they have to be for participants who participate on a full-time basis. You get to decide what regular attendance means. You get to outline that, um, but you get to outline performance, right? So it's not, so the department isn't telling you what that means. Like they, they have to come in, you know, and do all six weeks of the residential program or they don't get any stipends. They're not telling you that. They're just letting you know that there's regular attendance required. For another, for example, for McNair, they can do stipends up to $2,800 per year for students engaged in research internships. Um, and also necessary tuition room and board. So you can see how some of these are a little bit different. Um, in SSS, you can do student stipends as long as they're freshmen, predominantly freshmen or sophomores, or if they're at risk for leaving school. So that's another one where there's a little bit of a caveat in there as far as stipends go. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about is director authority. So this here is out of EOC because it's the number, it was the first thing in my handbook here. Um, so this is in regulations. This is in kind of other, the section is in kind of the other things that, that apply. So in this 32, so it might be a different, so if I looked in talent search in 643, I believe it is, it might not be number 32, but it's gonna be near the end. What other requirements must the grantee meet? So the grantee must give the project director sufficient authority to administer the project effectively. So that means that as a director, you've been hired for, for a certain job. You've been cleared not only by your institution, but also by the Department of Ed to be a director. You meet those qualifications. So you have the authority to make decisions. And so when an institution might maybe push back at you a little bit, you know, you have to maintain that sometimes you have to remind them that you have that authority, especially when you're operating in gray areas. Again, when we're operating in the area that's between, yes, you, it says you can do this, or it doesn't say that I can't do this. And there's a lot of those areas because the regulations can't cover every situation. And so some directors are very black and white. If it doesn't say that I can, then I'm not gonna do that. I'm just not comfortable with that. Where another director is willing to go further into the gray and has their reasoning to back that up. And either are fine because of what this says, that you have that authority, okay? Are there any, any questions? I'm trying to 
I just wanted to clarify something real quick, Tracy. Sure. Um, SSS, we have grant aid. Yes. Stipends, and that acts a little differently as far as how it gets logged um, and how it affects the student's uh, financial aid. So yes. the only difference, it's, it's funky. Um, and if you wrote it into your grant, just for those of you who, you can write it into your grant. Lately, they've been making you continue that number mm -hmm. if you write it. I used to be that we could say, hey, we have extra money this year, can we just use that? But also, if you already have it in there, even if you write a little bit, um, I find that's really helpful as well to be a little more flexible. Yeah, right. I mean, in, in, you're right, in SSS, you can say, I'm gonna give everybody, a, let's say $1,000. I have some carryover, so now I'm gonna do 1,500. Then you have to continue that 1,500 through the rest of the grant cycle or you have to ask for permission from your program officer to lower it back down. So, right, you, do, you don't have as much flexibility within that same line item. Um, let's see here. Oh, I had a question. Yes. So also on the, um, the director authority, uh -huh. so this has to do with the fact that I have the authority to figure out how the money is spent. So I'm the one that authorizes all expenditures as far as, and the, like my institution says that I can't authorize my own travel because, you know, that's just not sure. Cool. But right. I authorize all other expenditures. So I'm assuming that what this is meaning, because I had this question the other day and I had to really think about it. So that means that directors should have the final authority. It shouldn't have to go up through the chain of command every time you want to spend money. Partially, I would say that's right. I think that you have the the authority to say why you want to spend that money and why it's allowed, why you see it's allowable right. out of all those things. Um, I know for me, like I kind of spend my money, but my grants office ultimately will sign off on it too. And it's every once in a while they'll ask me like, "What do you mean by this?" But for the most part, they're kind of rubber stamping it. But you really yeah. want that checks and balances because not everybody is as knowledgeable as you are, right? And right. There, we've all heard horror stories of people going out and using grant funds to go buy guitars and, you know, trips to wherever and personal things like that. Um, because if you don't have the checks and balances, then, and somebody's not, um, ethical, then you can run into issues like that. But you're right, Christine. I think that this is, yeah, you can, you have that authority to say this, I've, I've had the training. This is what I think and why. Okay. Yeah. Because we had yeah. the question if it wasn't so much the checks and balances done by your grants office, but it was more that this director supervisor had to sign off on it, the VP of the section had to sign off for it, and then it went to the grants people. And I don't think that they would have to have, it's not required and they shouldn't be asked to have their supervisor okaying, authorizing the purchases that they feel that they should be able to make as the director. Yeah. yeah, well, and I would ask too in that situation, are you requiring that of every other department that's under you? Right. Or are you just requiring it of me as a grant? Because that's where that consistent treatment comes in that yeah. we have to be wary of. Okay. Yeah, good, good, good point. Okay, fiscal monitoring, fun stuff. We're, we're doing the fun stuff today. Okay, so there's external fiscal monitoring, such as audits performed, um, which every all of your institutions have audits done every year. Sometimes TRIO is included, sometimes they're not. If you have grants that are over $750,000, I believe is the cutoff, then you're typically in every year. And a lot of times your institution's controller's office or business office might take care of all of it. Like they might not even have a question for you, but every once in a while, I know for me, they might come in and say, why is this student eligible? Let's pull eligibility, which is kind of funny because most of the time you have to train the auditor about what the eligibility even means for your program, because they're not familiar with your specific program. They're just determining allowability or eligibility. So it's, it's kind of a interesting process. US Department of Ed site visits. Um, I think that the, the, the Department of Ed has in the past year since I've been around, hasn't done a lot of them, but I think they're doing more virtual ones 
where they ask you to upload certain documents and then they do it virtually as opposed to coming out. Um, yeah. And of course, if you have red flags, right? If you have um, large um, available balances, if you're not meeting numbers, all of these say, if you know there's something going on with your financial aid, different things like that, throw up red flags and that could be a reason why you might get a site visit too. So we don't want that to happen. That's why we do trainings like this today. Um, Tracy, also, yes. um, I just wanted to add to that, that the Department of Ed at the policy seminar um, did state also that they are restarting site visits and such. Um, so uh, I think that that caused a little bit of anxiety for folks that were attending, but um, I can imagine like they're wanting to, to do that more often now that they are a little bit more settled post-pandemic. Right. Well, and I, I can't say that I blame them. I mean, we are given large sums of money. And if I were giving, I mean, if I gave, you know, some, some kid $5,000 of my money and he had laid out how he was going to spend it, I would probably want some oversight over that. So it's not unreasonable. It just doesn't feel good, I think, is, is why we get scared. So Another thing is your G5 drawdown. So we do our, our fiscal drawdowns from the Department of Ed. So we spend the money and then our business office submits reports and a drawdown request to the Department of Ed in G5, which is their system. And then we get reimbursed. So that's kind of how the system works. And so ultimately, if we are slow in drawing down, which to be perfect in all, honesty, my institution has been very slow in drawing down. We hadn't drawn down in like six months. And it's kind of like, come on, people, we got it. You know, you don't understand because we had turnover. There was all kinds of things going on, but they didn't understand like what that meant, what that could mean for us as an institution. And so we're, we're back on track now, I'm happy to report. But, um, you know, we don't, that isn't, how we want to do business. You want those regular drawdowns because then otherwise you get these large um, carryovers and they want to know why because ultimately when we put our budgets in at the beginning of the year, we're saying we're going to spend this money by this date or by this time and we should be down to zero if we don't have other extenuating circumstances. Okay, so peer audit. So you knew I was gonna talk about this, if you know me. So peer reviews, NAOP has peer review program, can mimic a federal audit. It's a totally an allowable cost. Again, going back to evaluation. Um, it includes looking at your budget, your program files, your policy procedure manuals, all of the good things. And it's a great way to be prepared. Um, I am getting ready to have mine done here probably this next year in talent search. Um, and it's always, it's always an interesting process because we always find things. There's always things that we can improve on and there's great things that we're doing that we want others to know. And so again, highly recommend peer review. If you need more information, contact Christine and she'll be able to get that to you. Okay, internal fiscal monitoring. So this is the importance of having a soft ledger or shadow ledger. So um, basically what this is like, and I'm gonna again date myself here. So it's like a check register, okay? So it's like writing out what, where you spent your money, right? And seeing where that went. And then at the end of the month, when the, you get your bank statement, then that's when you reconcile things because there's going to be times because at our, our institutions, they really only reconcile things once a month and we usually get a report or something like that. Well, we could have spent quite a bit of money during the month. So our institution would say, oh, you have $50,000 when I know that I spent 30,000 this month because I'm a UB program and it's summertime. And so that's where we, why we want to keep a shadow ledger. So we know I could say by the day, kind of where my money's at. Also, it's good because sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes my fiscal office might give, might charge my grant for something that's actually something clear across campus because somebody typed in a number wrong, which happens. But I would never know that if I didn't have the, 
the shadow ledger to know what I needed. So that's important that you have one of those. And it can be something simple, like an Excel spreadsheet. It doesn't have to be anything, anything extraordinary. Okay. Um, so again, spending the money how you say you're supposed to. Um, your program officer might see what your projections are. So it's not enough to say this is how much I'm going to spend this year. It's you have to keep on track of okay, this is how much money I have left to spend. You know, how much money as I get towards the end of the year, um, is it time for me to buy supply? Maybe I need to redo, um, right now I'm needing to upgrade my computers because they're getting old. So that might be something I might do as I have money near the end of the year or something like that. Or I know that I have like upward bound, they get a lot of their money if they're not June 1st start dates at the end, they spend most of their money at the very end of the year, right? And so they're very closely monitoring how much money they have because they're going to spend a large amount in summer programming at the end of the year. So true or false, the institution's fiscal management system is the only one needed to keep track of the grant budget and expenditures. I, 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 see, I only see a few people, so I see some, some some no's is what I'm seeing. A false is what I'm seeing, right? That's you. It's that's correct. You need. That's why we need the shadow ledger. Okay. Good job. Okay. Next, time and effort reporting. So we all have to do time and effort because we're paid by the grant. Okay. So this is talking. This is the formal speak of why we keep time and effort. It's based on actual hours worked. And if it's based on budgeted numbers, the controls could include an after the fact method to review the actual time worked. So it's okay. Like for example, when I had SSS and talent search, when I was when I first started, I was split as a director 50 50, because that makes sense, you know, that's just split in half. But what I found is that I was really spending more time with my SSS because I was physically located with my SSS program. And my talent search folks were out in the schools all the time. So after the first year, we went and we split it 60-40 moving forward because of looking back on how I had done, been doing it before. It was kind of like, no, it's it, this is more accurate, a reflection of my time and effort. Um, you Total effort is what you're going to do on a time and effort form. So I'm just going to, this is, um, one a sample one that I've used a long time. So you can see here that they spend 45% of their time in actual institutional duties, and then they spend 55% of their time on grants. But it everything has to total to 100. Yes, Dina. Hi, question. I know there's some, for example, the University of Washington does a quarterly Mm -hmm. uh, time and effort report. Um, my practice is that I do both. I have something like this, and then I have what the university holds or does. Mm -hmm. What would be the best practice? Um, when I started working for Harris University Camp, I was by my mentor shown this, given a, a template that still used with my current staff. The other part is now my staff have to do a timesheet where they go into our um system to put in the hours they're working mm -hmm. so can i just keep that and i move forward and not having to do something like this where they write in how what percentage they work in you know academic instruction or administrative support or pd um what would be the best practice for that for time and effort i would say that you should have them do because basically their time sheet is just showing the time essentially right but this is more like going to show what their time and effort is and a hundred percent of it not just the one now if they're i mean it's great like my talent search staff everybody but my admin is a hundred percent like they're just that's all they do is talent search so that makes it easy it's the split funded people that make things a challenge um for us but i would you know i would have something like this like you said where you're signing it quarterly and um, it could, that's probably what I would do is have something like that. Yeah, good question though. Thank you. 
Hey, Dina, something I was thinking about, because I had the same thing for my uh, fiscal office, and they were like, well, if it's 100%, they're really looking at the split situation where another department's paying. But internally, it was really helpful to advocate for some position shifts and increases to know and be able to tie it into the school as a whole as far as effort it was taking to, to do these things. Um, so I think it's a great leverage tracking if you ever need it. That's a great point. Um, time and effort is important. This is where people can get in trouble. Um, people, there's been people that have had to pay back millions and millions of dollars because time and effort wasn't done or wasn't done correctly. So you wanna make sure that you're doing it. If you're not doing it, start doing it now, um, even if it's in your office. I mean, Dina had mentioned that her institution does it, which, which makes sense, large institution, especially with research going on, there's lots of grants. But if you're at a smaller institution that doesn't, you might be the only, one of the only grants on campus, they might not be as aware of this. So this is something for you to do. So if you um, maybe in that situation, you know, if you wanted to, to um, email Kessia, who could get in touch with me, I'm happy to give you kind of a sample of what, of what we do. It's pretty, pretty low key, um, easy to follow. So you wanna make sure that you have something because when an auditor comes in, they're gonna be looking for it. Um, okay, another question. So this is A, B, or C. Total effort is defined as time, total time employee works on the grant, total time employee works on all activities of the institution, or total time employee works on non-federally funded activities at the institution. I can't see the chat, so I'm gonna I'm gonna defer. I don't know why I can't see the chat. Oh, there we go. There's a chat. I like how somebody threw in an F. That's great. You're correct. It is B. It is B. All the work. So 100%. Okay. Okay. So this next part, I'm probably just going to go over real quickly because I know we're kind of hitting, getting a little close to time here. And um, I want some time for you guys to talk. So budget modifications. There's basically five reasons why you would need a to request what we call prior approval from your program officer to do something, okay? So one of them is a change in scope of the project, which means you're making a big change from what you said you were gonna do in the grant. For example, in Talent Search once, um, when we had sequestration, I had to drop a, a school. And so I had to request that from the Department of Ed saying this is why we're doing it, this is our reasoning behind it, those kind of things. Um, it might be if, I'm just trying to, it's, it's frustrating sometimes because they don't define what a change in scope is. And so most of the time, the, the little modifications that you make in your program, because I thought this was a great idea, I thought this would work, we've tried it, it doesn't work at all. Um, so we're gonna modify it. That really most of the time isn't a change in scope at all. Think big, big major things like target schools, those kind of things are different areas. Another thing is a change in key personnel as defined in the GAN. That's usually your project director or your um, principal investigator. Um, this is why you list very few people in the, the key personnel. So it could be that the, um, as a director, I was seen, overseeing one grant, now I'm gonna oversee two, so I'm gonna be 50-50. So I was 100%. So now I need to request permission, which is allowable to be a director over more than one program that's in the regulations now that it's allowable to do that. And that's kind of what you cite, but you still have to ask for permission based on this, okay? The third one is if the project director is disengaged from the project for more than three months or has a 25% or greater reduction in the time devoted. So if I'm changing something and it's only 24% change, I don't have to ask permission, okay? So it's knowing these intricacies that's gonna help you, again, going back to that director authority, okay? Okay. The next is a transfer of funds, the inclusion unless waived, 
Uh, okay, transfer of funds budgeted for participant support costs to other categories expense. So this is student stipends. So this is why if, like a few minutes ago when we were talking about um, if I had $1,000 in student stipends and now I upped it to 1500, why I have to keep it at that line. I can't move, I can move things around in the budget, everything around in the budget other than things out of student stipends. So for example, right now, I have a big carryover in my um, camp budget right now because we didn't serve the number of students that we were funded to serve. So I had budgeted you know, $5,000 per student, let's say. Well, we didn't serve as many, so I have carry forward in that, but I can't use it to take students on, let's say, a trip because, I, because that's not student stipends. I'd have to get permission to do that. So it's not that I can't, I have to get permission, okay? So you wanna make sure, it's kind of like the less you have to ask permission for the better, but sometimes it's in your best interest to ask for permission, if that makes sense. Okay. Hey, Tracy. Yes, how are you? Good, thank you. Can you use the money for the scholarships? I think yes. I hear before Kerry talking about a little bit about that, like the 20% and less, so you have to continue doing that. Is that almost the same? Yeah, so the student stipends, the, the student grant aid is considered in that same, it's that same line item, yes. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Another thing, so those are the things for prior approval. Another thing that you can do that I wanted to point out is you can, there are pre-award costs that you can use your grant money prior to the start of the next year for the next year. So let's say um, NAOP is a perfect example. NAOP um, registration costs or um, registrations will open during the summer, right? And so if I were talent search, I don't get my new money till the 1st of September. I don't want to wait because I want that early bird discount. So I can incur costs ahead of time. The problem comes, especially with brand, let's say a brand new grant, is I'm allowed to do that. But then what happens if I don't get funded? Then the institution is, out, is liable for that money. Like they're not getting reimbursed for it. So there's always a balance of doing that, especially in a grant writing year, as opposed to kind of a continuation year. Um, let's see here, we can do a one-time extension at the end of a program, um, at the end of, a, of our five years. Um, we basically can't, a lot of times you can't, it's to finish out the grant right? It's to get your APR done, get your files in order, all of those kind of, your, do your stuff with your equipment. It's not necessarily to go on and serve more students, usually. So you have to outline what that is, but you can get it, initiate a one-time extension. Um, so I'm going to flip past this. I don't know, Kessia, do you want to go into, I have more, but I think we probably want to go into our groups now because you usually stop at four, correct? Yes. Or five, yes. depending four. on what four. time zone we're in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you want to maybe, um, uh, it's about three minutes to 3.45. Do you so want me to go a few more minutes? Yeah, a few more minutes and then we'll okay. break out. Okay, so I'll just continue on. So into record keeping. So this is in part of our program assurances. So for example, if this is a UB one. This is very typical, not less than two thirds of the participants will be low income first gen. Remaining can be either or have high academic risk. No student denied participation because of entering after ninth grade and that they're, they're gonna collaborate. So some of these things, um, some of the record keeping that we have to keep, for example, for talent search is eligibility, that they're eligible to participate in the program, that they have a need, the services that 
we offered them or that we gave them that they made educational progress. So that may come from transcripts or those kind of things and also coordination with like programs. So these are some different things that come with record keeping. Um, audits. Um, annual performance report is kind of an audit, right? We had, they're typically due, this is, this is funny in this year to even say this, they're by law, they're required to be done 90 days after the expiration of the grant. So 90 days, so if I'm a September 1st start, right, by November 30th, I should be submitting my annual performance report. Well, here it is at mid-April and I'm just starting my annual performance report for talent search. So it's silly, really, but that's, that's what the rules say, but the department isn't necessarily following those rules. But here we are again, it's not, and why wouldn't we have to, I mean, it makes sense that we would have to submit an annual performance report. We've, we have an agreement for this amount of money, we're gonna do this type of work and this is our outcomes. And it's good for us to have to report those outcomes. Okay, I guess that was all I had and it is 344, so we made it. Yeah. I, this was, a, I mean, I again, I encourage you all to go to legislation regulation training that priority to um, if you can't, um, you know, travel to whatever exotic place they're having it. Um, I invite you to have to hire somebody to come in and do the training for you and your staff. Um, that's something that's very, very doable and actually sometimes ends up costing less depending on how you go or if you have some money to spend and you want to bring in a Lucy Jones or somebody like that and you know from across the country and get some great training then that's another thing to do too but everybody needs to attend not just directors I just really want to hit that home okay it needs to be advisors it needs to be um, admin staff it needs to be people that work in your grants office that was something that I was able to do here in February was our grants director came and that was huge for us because then she got to see kind of the reasoning why we do what we do. Um, so I just can't say enough and don't just go once, go as many times as you can because you get different things every time. And um, I'm always reminded of things that I need to be doing whenever I go to these. So it's great opportunity. So thank you for having me today, I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, let's give Tracy a virtual round of applause. Thank you so much, Tracy, um, for, for sharing information with us. Um, we are going to go ahead and move into breakout rooms. Um, if there are any burning questions um, uh, that you want to ask specific to your program, Matt is going to set up all the uh, breakout rooms according to um, program. Um, and we encourage you to have some questions uh, prepared going in there. Um, so that way uh, there can be a robust conversation for our last 15 minutes together. And after that, we will go ahead and um, end our session. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and say thank you now for attending and we hope to see you um, during the next professional development, uh, professional development um, series. Thank you. All right, y'all should see an option to self-select here. So if anybody's having issues, just let me know and I can think manually throw you in one. Tracy, do you mind sh sharing the PowerPoint? Yeah, I can do that, Mercedes. Thank I'll send you. it to Kessia. Yep. Thank you. Okay, Matt, where am I seeing this? You want me to just put you in SSS? Um, actually, let me, I must stick around and talk to Tracy. Okay. I can stop the recording too, we don't. Yeah, let's stop the recording. <laughs>